All right, so welcome back, everyone. I just recorded 20 minutes of the next episode and realized my audio wasn't recording, so here I am. Round two, I know it even better. Now I'm gonna give you guys an even better tutorial. All right, cool. So this is where we left off, people. For you guys just tuning in who were not able to, uh, who, who didn't wanna go through the initial setup phase, um, this is kind of where we left off. So we're going to be coding Star Shower, as you see right here, and we just installed the canvas boilerplate and opened it up in Sublime Text. And if you look over here, we have a canvas being displayed in the browser that takes up the entire width, entire height of the screen automatically because we ran all the canvas boilerplate commands. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just analyzing the star shower piece, what do we need to do first? What's the most important thing? Well, to me, it's going to be those stars falling from the sky and then exploding at the bottom. Um, I think that's going to be the most important thing because it's going to give you guys the, the most knowledge overall compared to the little extra features such as stuff in the back. We're going to be coding all this, don't worry, but let's go ahead and focus on the most important thing, which is going to be those stars falling from the top. So how do we code that? We're going to start off with just one singular star, and then we're going to go ahead and code multiple stars falling at the same time. But to make things simple, understandable, we're going to focus on just one star. So let's go ahead and get one star that falls from the top of our screen, hits the bottom, bounces up and down due to gravity, and then eventually stays still. So how the hell do we do that? Well, let's go ahead and look at our code. First thing first, Let's get rid of all the code that we don't actually need. So looking back at the canvas piece, this has nothing to do with mouse movement whatsoever. There's no mouse movement effects, no interaction, and that might be something you wanna add down the line, but to replicate this, we really don't need any mouse movement. So we can go ahead and get rid of everything related to our mouse, such as this mouse constant right here. We can get rid of this mouse move event listener. And then I'm going to do a quick find for anything else mouse related. And really the last thing mouse related is this fill text thing that you see right here. We don't need that. So if we go ahead and save, we're going to get a beautiful blank canvas, nothing on it. Perfect, that's all we really need. All right, so to create an actual star, an actual circle, an actual object that falls from the sky, we're going to be focusing on this object function right here. Now we don't wanna create something generic such as an object, we wanna make sure that we specify what it is we're going to draw. So we are going to be creating a star. And the star is going to have properties, an X and Y coordinate, a radius for its size, and then also a color to determine what color should the star be. And it's also going to have a draw and update function. This draw function determines what the circle, what the star actually looks like on the screen. And we can tell that it's going to be a circle based on this arc function right here. This arc function that says, where should we start drawing this arc? In the X coordinate, the Y coordinate provided from the star when we create it, it should be drawn as large as the radius that we specify when we create the star as well. And this arc function also says how wide should the arc be? Since we're going from zero to math pi times two, that just specifies we're creating a full circle. And basically this is the function that's going to determine how the circle is actually rendered on the screen. We could put a square here, we could put a triangle, an image, but we know that these stars should be circular. So we are going to keep things as is. This update function, it calls this draw function. So literally it's just calling the code right here. And the reason we're putting this right here is because I wanna make sure that uh, we have a little bit of differentiation between what our object actually looks like and how it's being affected as time goes on. So the draw function determines what it looks like, while within update, we're going to be altering our object's properties, such as its X and Y coordinates to make it move left, right, up and down. I just wanna make sure that I segregate things off for clean code purposes to ensure that this is as easy as, easy as possible for me to come back to later on to read. Uh, one more thing to note here, just looking at this, is we're making use of prototype functions rather than a typical function that you would see within a star object like this. Now, what is the difference between creating a function in here, such as draw equal to function, and then including all this code, compared to creating a function as a prototype? Well, really, it's a little bit of performance purpose. If we were to create 500 to 1,000 stars and use a draw function as you see right here, 
Well, each individual star object would have its own individual draw function, which means we have to create this draw function each time a star is created. And if we were to use the prototype method to get rid of this and use the prototype method instead, well, our star will only reference one particular function. So this function is only created once, but we're just referencing it rather than creating it over and over again. So it's a little bit of a performance boost. It's honestly not much. You'll probably experience like the same sort of uh, performance on the page, but um, from what I know, it is the way to improve performance as we're only referencing one function. We're only creating it once rather than creating multiple functions and using those on their own. All right. So we know we just created a star object. This is what's going to represent the actual star slash ball flying from the top of the screen. The star object needs a draw function. So we're going to say the star has a draw function and it also has an update function. So this is the blueprint for our star, what it's going to look like and how it's going to interact on the screen as things are being animated. But now we need to actually create a star on the screen. So we need to go to our implementation section and rather than reference objects, we're going to say reference stars instead. So this star array, we know that we need to create multiple stars within this canvas piece. Although we're only doing one right now, we know later on we're going to have multiple. And the way to create multiple stars on the screen is to have an array and create multiple star objects within this array that we can do things such as call those star objects functions such as update and draw. That might be a little confusing to hear, I know, but it's going to make a lot more sense as we continue onwards with this canvas piece. So if we were to create 400 stars and animate them on the screen, we would run this loop right here 400 times as specified by this number right here. But we know we only wanna create one star, so we're going to change it to one. And then we need to make sure that we're pushing a star into our stars array. So we're going to say, within our stars array, create a new star, and that this new star needs an X and Y coordinate. So where on the screen should our star be drawn? Let's say it should be drawn in the middle of our screen. So to draw it in the middle of our screen, we are going to locate our canvas's width, and this is specified at the top of the file right here. We're just saying canvas.width is equal to the inner width of our browser, and this is just a default variable that comes with uh, your window by default. So we're saying the width of our browser is going to be equal to our cam or our canvas's width is going to be equal to the width of our browser. And since we want it to be spawned in the middle, we're just going to divide that by half. Now let's go ahead and get this started at the top of the screen. To get the ball started, star, whatever you want to call it, I'm going to be I'm going to be using a lot of different terminology for this thing throughout this course, I guarantee it. Um, but to get the ball started at the top of the screen, we know that our canvas coordinate system starts from uh, a zero at the top and it starts going, it starts incrementing in value the further down you go from uh, the Y coordinate. So our Y coordinate starts at zero and down here it's something like 800 pixels. So to get the ball starting right here, let's just say that our ball's Y coordinate should be 30. Now we're not done just yet. Our star should also have a radius. So let's go ahead and specify our radius should be 30. And it also needs a color. Let's just say our color should be blue to start off just so we can easily see where it is at all times. So we're going to save that and you're not going to see anything just yet. In order to see the star being drawn on the screen, we need to make sure that we're calling its draw function, which in return calls all of this drawing code right here. And although we're creating a star and we're pushing it into our stars array, we're never actually calling this individual star objects draw function anywhere. We need to make sure that we're doing that within our animation loop because our animation loop is going to be run over and over and over again. And since it's being run over and over and over again, we need to make sure that each time we clear our canvas, we're also drawing something on top of it by calling our stars draw function. All right, so for each stars, replace objects with stars. For each stars within our array, so for each star within this array right here, we're going to be having multiple stars down the line. We want to reference each individual star. So this is referencing the new star that we just created and pushed into this stars array. And since we want to reference this individual star, we want to call this individual stars update function. So we're creating a new object 
if we're referencing the array, we're accessing that new object and then we're calling its update function, which in return calls draw right here. So if we save that, let's see if we get anything on the screen. And we do. So now you can see that our ball is on the top of the screen. And this seems like a lot, but we are now set up to start animating this. And how do we want to animate this? Well, we want to make sure that this ball is falling downwards on the screen. And that once it hits the bottom of the screen, that it goes back upwards and then gravity's soon affecting it, pulling it back down, can't go back up all the time. But yeah, let's go ahead and make sure that the ball is falling downwards towards the bottom of the screen. All right, so to get the ball moving downwards, we need to make sure that we're accessing the ball's Y coordinate and that we're always adding one onto it each time this update function is called. So this update function is going to be called within this animate loop over and over and over and over again. We need to make sure that we're always adding one onto the ball's Y position, and that's going to create the illusion of movement in the downwards direction. But you're going to see eventually, once this ball hits the bottom of the screen, it's just going to keep on going because we don't have any conditional that tells it, hey, I just hit the bottom of the screen. Let's go in the opposite direction. So that's going, to be, that's going to be the next step, is we need to be able to add some sort of conditional that says the ball should go in the opposite direction. So to add a conditional, what do we need to test for? Under what condition should the ball go in the opposite direction? Well, the condition is going to be when the ball's Y coordinate plus the ball's radius is greater than the canvas's height, we want to reverse this value right here. So let's go ahead and let's go ahead and analyze this real quick. I'm not going to do anything. Nothing's going to be in this conditional, but let's go ahead and analyze this. As the ball's Y coordinate is going downwards, we need to make sure that its radius is added onto it because if we don't add the radius onto it right here, the ball is going to bounce from the center rather than the side, rather than its perimeter, its outer edges. And we want to make sure that we're replicating what we see in Star Shower as accurately as possible. Stars don't fall from the sky, go halfward down into the ground, and then jump up with all this freaking dirt everywhere. It hits the edge. You know, yeah, the stars actually probably do go in the dirt and don't bounce up. But to get the effect we have here, they definitely don't go in the dirt. They definitely bounce off the dirt. So we want to make sure that the balls are bouncing off their perimeter rather than just their Y coordinate, which is why we're adding radius onto this. Now we know we need to change this one right here to a negative number because that's what's going to cause the ball to go upwards in the opposite direction. This one is our ball's velocity. And since we know we need to change this, we need to make this a variable. And within an object sense, we need to make it a property. So our star is going to have a velocity and this velocity is going to be equal to an object and this way we can specify our velocity has an x velocity our velocity has x and y values so we know that our star isn't going to be well eventually it's going to be moving left and right but for now let's just keep it singular let's just keep it centered no movement left and right just specify it as being zero, but our Y velocity is going to be moving downwards. It's currently one. It takes a while for it to get to the top and bottom of the screen. Let's go ahead and say our Y velocity is three instead, just to speed things up. If you save this, nothing's going to happen because we need to make sure that we're referencing our new property right here. But now if we save it, you're going to see the ball is falling much quicker and that's great, perfect. All right, so our ball is falling downwards. We have our velocity added onto and so forth, but we need to make sure that we're reversing this in the opposite direction once it hits the bottom of the screen. So let's add a comma right here. When ball hits bottom of screen, just so we understand what's going on, this velocity is going to be reversed. So the ball is traveling downwards, but once it hits the bottom, it's going to reverse this velocity and go in the opposite direction. And there it goes. So it's going to start going upwards and it's just going to keep on going upwards because we don't have gravity added onto this just yet. So gravity, gravity is a constant downward pull added onto the ball's velocity, the speed at which it falls. It's an acceleration effect. And if you would like to learn more about gravity, I do have an entire Canvas episode dedicated to it if you really wanna get into the details of it. But to add gravity into this, we need to create an else statement to this conditional. 
And like I said, gravity is just a constant downward pull on the y velocity. So our gravity, we can just set it equal to one. And now if we look at this, let's watch what happens. The ball now continuously falls downwards because it has that constant pull. It's never going to go all the way back up and you'll never see it again because we have that constant downward pull, which we call gravity. Um, but this isn't exactly realistic as of yet because the ball keeps bouncing up and down to the same height. And it's not losing any energy to the floor like you would see in a real world scenario. I believe we call that friction. That's what I'm going to call it. So when the ball hits the ground, uh, friction should take effect and its energy should be spread out into the floor beneath it. And to emulate that, uh, not only are we going to essentially reverse the velocity of the ball once it hits the bottom of the screen, but we're also going to decrease its velocity. And to do that, we're going to multiply it by a percentage. So this is representative of friction. This is representative of gravity. And if we save that, let's go ahead and watch. Okay, so you'll see friction is starting to take effect, but we end up having an error here. The ball gets stuck and it seems like it's implanted in the ground and that it's never coming back up. And the reason being is we don't actually have our velocity being added onto this conditional. So we wanna make sure that we're monitoring our Y position, the ball's radius, and also the velocity being added onto it. And once all that added together is greater than the canvas's height, that's going to make sure that it doesn't get stuck on the bottom like this. So let's go ahead and watch that again. And I think I... I already know we got it because I did it last episode and I completely forgot to record my audio. Okay, cool, perfect. Um, but yeah, I would say this is a pretty good uh, place to end this episode and go on to the next one. Um, actually, really quickly, before we do, let's go ahead and add some good coding practices onto this. So if we were to come back to this later on and look at our code, it would be very hard for us to understand what 0 0.8 is and what 1 is. Like, what do these numbers actually refer to? So it's good practice to actually create a variable or property for these instead. So we're going to say this dot gravity for the one right here, and for the 0 0.8, we're going to reference this dot friction instead. And since we're referencing it right here, we haven't actually declared a friction or gravity yet for our object. So we need to make sure that we declare these up here. Our friction was equal to 0 0.8 and our gravity was equal to one. So this is just going to make it easier for us to understand what's happening here. Rather than referencing obscure numbers, now we know that 0 0.8 references friction and gravity, or one references gravity instead. And if we save this, you'll see the same thing's going to happen. Everything works as expected, which is perfect. All right, everyone, so I recorded the audio on this one. I'm very proud of myself, I know. Um, in the next episode, we're going to be creating this little explosion effect that you see right here when the ball hits the bottom. So when this ball right here, as it bounces and hits the bottom of the screen, we're going to be creating those mini particles that explode in outward directions. So I hope you all are excited and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. All right, peace.